Thank you, Jürgen, for the introduction, and also like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak today. So, as Jürgen said, I'm a, a computational modeler, and my main focus now is on musculoskeletal ageing. So, prior to that, back when I first started, when I joined Newcastle in 2000, I was interested in molecular mechanisms of DNA damage and loss of protein homeostasis with age. And initially, in fact, modelling has changed quite a lot over the years since I've been at Newcastle. So, initially, I was sort of building models in programming languages like C and Java, so it's going a long way back. But this didn't really engage the experimental biologists who we were trying to work with. And it's when we changed to use the systems biology markup language that really the experimental biologists really came on board. And in 2005, we then got funding for this Centre for Integrated Systems Biology of Aging and Nutrition, which was originally led by Professor Tom Kirkwood, who was really the driving force behind sort of showing that we need to look at integrated mechanisms of aging. And although the, the initial funding was run out, we still, it's still funded over different project grants and the director now, Daryl Shanley, who's also here in the audience. So the aims of CISPA, as I say, was to look at integrated systems and also to engage experimental biologists, and also because there's such a lot of omic data, we also work with bioinformaticians. And this was so successful that we then later went on to um, a sort of joint venture with Liverpool and Sheffield to get funding for a centre for integrated research into musculoskeletal ageing. And again, one of the sort of prime the ways of working was to use systems biology approaches, and I was asked to lead the modelling work within SEMA. So the aim of SEMA is to develop an integrated approach to understanding the processes and effects of ageing in tissues of the musculoskeletal system. And also there's a lot of funding uh, provided to provide training for the young scientists too, because obviously we want to train young scientists to start using these systems biology approaches. But not only do they learn to do modelling techniques, but also learning the experimental side of work as well. And you will hear some, one or two of these students to, to today and tomorrow. So all our musculoskeletal tissues decline with age. We know that there's loss of muscle mass with age. But as you can see in this graph, it's very variable between individuals, but there's always this uh, gradual decline with age. Similarly for bone, at sort of about age 30 with males and both females, you get a loss of uh, bone mass with age. Notice this sharp accelerated loss in females. This is due to menopause where there's changes in hormones, so hormonal changes also drive this loss in bone mass. And also in articular cartilage, we know that there's loss of cartilage with age. Um, so, although this is a, a general feature of ageing, it comes to a point where perhaps the, um, the loss of bone mass or muscle or cartilage becomes so severe that the disease is diagnosed. And osteoarthritis is a disease of the joints, where you get the spinning of the cartilage. And osteoporosis due to loss of bone mass, leading to increased risk of factors. And then sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle mass and muscle weakness, leading to increased risk of falls. And all these diseases cause considerable morbidity in the elderly population. They really reduce quality of life. A lot of people end up having to go into care because if they, if they start having falls, they fracture bones, and it can be very detrimental in old age. So we know that age is a major risk factor for these diseases, but what we really don't know is how aging actually contributes to the disease, and whether there's anything we can do about it to try and slow down the process of, these, of this loss of tissue with age, or to try and stop it altogether. So we know that there's a lot of mechanisms involved in aging from my previous research at Newcastle, working with many people, and we know there's many mechanisms involved, such as up-to-date stress, inflammation, loss of protein homeostasis, and so on. And although uh, there's many more which aren't shown on this diagram, and also what I haven't really shown, sorry, to go back, is that all these mechanisms interact. So there's lots of interactions between the different mechanisms. So you can't just look at one mechanism by itself. You really need to use an integrative approach and, and think of all the different processes that are going on in ageing. And similarly, in musculoskeletal ageing, all these processes will contribute to the loss in muscle, bone and cartilage that we see. So the purpose of the modelling in this work is to try and increase our understanding of these complex regulatory pathways and try and to investigate the key mechanisms that drive the age-related changes. We always want to uh, build models that are going to be predictive so that we can then generate testable predictions which then can be tested in the laboratory and also very useful and what they often experimental biologists are very keen on is to try and perhaps suggest potential interventions. So we can use the model to try and um, see if we can perhaps improve the situation from the outcomes. So today I'm just going to go through three different examples of, of models that I've been working on recently. First, 
first two on os- about loss of cartilage and osteophritis, and the third one on bone remodeling, which is relevant to osteoporosis. So osteophritis, so why are we really interested in this? Mainly because there's very few treatments for it at the moment, apart from pain relief and joint replacement in the extreme. And joint replacements aren't very satisfactory either because they only last for about 10 to 15 years. But, so what we really want to know is, is why does the cartilage thin as we age? So, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong one. So this is a normal joint, and we can see the cartilage sort of aligning the ends of the bones here in between the synovial fluid. And the cartilage, this helps to pro- uh, provide strength to the joint and allows it to withstand uh, high forces. But as we age, this, this cartilage thins. That means the bones rub together, which can be painful and also makes the joints weaker. So what is cartilage? It's mainly composed of extracellular matrix. About 95% of the articular cartilage is, is, is composed of the matrix. And within the matrix, this is mainly built up of collagen type 2 fibers. And, surrounded, and this is surrounded by agricum, which is a proteoglycan. And this absorbs water and, and gives it the, the able to withstand compressive forces. But dotted throughout the matrix, are there's just one cell type within the cartilage called chondrocytes. And these are interspersed through the matrix, and it's thought that each chondrocyte is responsible for maintaining the surrounding cartilage. So this one will maintain the cartilage here, and this one here, and so on. But not this spread about through the, through the matrix. So, so how is cartilage homeostasis maintained? Well, normally there's actually very little turnover, but obviously mechanical strain can cause some damage to the cartilage, and in which case this will produce a, a temporary inflammatory response. And then you get uh, upregulation of cytokines, and this will then upregulate catabolic enzymes such as adenosylases and MMP1 and MMP13, and both and all these uh, enzymes will degrade the cartilage. But in addition, MM, MMPs will actually cleave TGF beta, which is found in the matrix. So TGF beta is very abundant in the matrix, but normally it's in a latent, inactive form, and it needs to be cleaved by an MMP become active so they can then bind to the receptors. So this then provides the homeostatic mechanism, so then the TGF beta will bind to receptors and this will then lead to upregulation of, of anabolic pathways leading to production of new cartilage components such as agricum and collagen too. Now these pathways have been quite well studied, a lot is known about each individual pathway, but what is less well known is how the pathways interact and really what actually goes wrong with ageing. So we know that IL-1 works through the um, MACK pathway leading to phosphorylation of JNK and c which forms dimers. And this forms what's called an AP-1 complex, which leads to upregulation of MMP and ADMPS. IL-6 and OSM are, are cytokines which work through the jak stat pathway. And this uh, may be protected because it actually upregulates uh, TIMC, which is actually an inhibitor of MMPs but it also upregulates C FOS, which may also lead to upregulation of MMPs, as we'll see. And TNF-alpha then works through the NFKB pathway, and again, we get uh, an increase in MMPs through this pathway, and also this, we get this positive feedback because NFKB will also upregulate cytokines, which are the feedback here. Uh, in addition, we do get some negative feedback, so usually in, reg- in regulatory pathways, they will upregulate negative uh, feedback mechanisms, so SOX will stop this pathway and I kappa B alpha will, will stop the NF kappa B going into the nucleus. So the group in Newcastle, the muscle sprinkler research group that I work very closely with, have devised this experimental system of studying cartilage degradation. So they use chondrocytes, uh, so cell culture model. They also use human articular cartilage tissue, which they can derive from knee or hip when patients have joint replacements. And also they have control uh, cartilage from patients as well who haven't got osteophritis, who haven't replacements for some other reason. Then in the experimental system, they actually speed up the cartilage degradation process by adding cytokines to the cells or to the tissue. They use IL-1 and oncostatin M. And then some of the things that they measure once they've added these cytokines is the expression of the matrix degrading enzymes and the degradation of aggregate and collagen tissue. Right, so I'm just going to show you some data, which was rather interesting. This was back in 2001, but this has really got me interested in the, sort of the first model that I started to build. Because what they did, they, they took some chondrocytes and they decided um, that they add either... Ha- so the first layer is control, where they didn't add any cytokines. 
sorry, so lane one is the control. So that without any cytokines, we don't get any upregulation of MMP1. So we just look at one, and they looked at different time points after 72 hours. Whereas there was beta expression of the MMP1 inhibitor, TIMP1, and this seems to be upregulated over time as well. If they just added IL1, so this is now lane two, which I highlight, to the cells, they get an increase in MMP1. So shown here, and it seems to increase and get, reaches maximum about eight to 12 hours and then starts to decline again as it gets degraded. And not much effect on TIMP1. On the other hand, if they add Onchostatin M, they don't get any upregulation of MMP1, so no MMP1 appears at all, and they actually get an increase in TIMP1, suggesting that Onchostatin M is a protective pathway. So they thought that perhaps if they added Onchostatin M with IL-1, that could perhaps alleviate the effects of IL-1. However, when they added both cytokines to the cells, what they saw, is, in fact, was that you've got more MMP1 upregulated than IL-1 alone. So you've got this synergistic effect, and in fact, the TIMP1 seemed to go down. So adding Onchostatin M to IL-1 made matters worse. So this was very interesting. And I talked to one of the students who was working on the project at the time, and he seemed to think that perhaps it was something to do with the competition between C. June and C. Fos for the AP1 complexes. And he asked me perhaps if I could model this and then perhaps sort of see whether this, his hypothesis could be tested. And also, the experimenters wanted to see if I could um, go on and use the model to find simulated interventions to reduce cartilage breakdown. So here in my model, I show simply that when collagen gets broken down, these two uh, a lot of collagen fragments, and this is what they can actually measure in the cells. So I included this in the model as well. So every time a collagen molecule gets broken down, we get an extra collagen fragment. And then to see whether there's any interventions in the model that could do to reduce the number of these fragments. So I built the model in a sort of a modular way. So first of all, I built a, a model of the IL-1 pathway. And quite a lot of is already known about this, so there's quite a lot of information in the literature on this pathway. So just to go for it briefly, so IL-1 binds to its receptor, which then recruits the kinase ERAC2, which then recruits TRAP6. This leads to phosphorylation of P38 and also J and K. Then J and K, once it's phosphorylated, will phosphorylate C June. It then forms dimers, and then um, bind to DNA of the various different genes and get upregulation of these MMPs at the TS, and also C June itself leading to some positive feedback. But in addition, it will also upregulate phosphatases, and this helps to switch off the signaling. For example, DUF16 will then dephosphorylate J and K. This is important because obviously once the signaling, once you get an inflammatory response and you get some signal, you don't want it to be on permanently. So these, these feedback mechanisms are important. So similarly, I developed a separate model then of the statin M signaling pathway. So again, a lot, quite a lot known about this in the literature. So this binds to its receptor, and then this leads to phosphorylation of JAK1 which is phosphorylation of STAT3, which um, is, not, is in the cytoplasm, but once it's phosphorylated, it can go into the nucleus, and then we get upregulation of CFOS, and also SOX3, which produces negative feedback, because that stops OSM binding to the receptor. CFOS is not active until it's phosphorylated, and it's phosphorylated by P38. And if you remember, that was phosphorylated in the, in the IL-1 model, so there's a connection there. And then CFOS, uh, if it, can't bind to DNA by itself, but only when it's uh, in complex with C. June. And once it's in complex with C. June, we get even higher upregulation of all these MMPs and also C. Fos and C. June as well. And again, also get some of these negative feedback um, phosphatases being upregulated. So to model cartilage breakdown, well, it's known that when MMPs are trans translated, they're actually inactive and they're actually termed by the biologists as pro-MMPs and they need to be cleaved before they can be active and actually will cleave collagen. And they're cleaved by various proteases and for the model they, they said could I just use the term MMP activated because they're investigating which proteases are most important and they really haven't yet quite reached a conclusion as to which one it is. So I just called it MMP activator in the model. So this activates MMP1 and also MMP3, and MMP3 in turn will activate uh, MMP13. But it's just MMP1 and MMP13 which will degrade collagen. Now collagen is normally protected by agrocrine. It's not only degraded when, it's, when agrocrine is degraded first. So I model this by assuming that it's in a complex, and when agrocrine is degraded, this releases the collagen mo molecule, which can then be degraded by MMP. 
So I built the model using SBML shorthand. So I, I built sort of an IO1 model and an OSM model, and then I sort of combined them together. And I found SBML shorthand quite a good way for building up the model structure because it's quite quick and easy to do. And this was developed by Darren Wilkinson at Newcastle. And then we use a Python tool to convert it to full SBML. And then once I've got the model structure, I imported it into, um, oh yes, just a word before going into the, the capacity modeling, that all the models that I have developed, I, I've um, uploaded them all into bio models and they've all been created. And we'd like to thank VG for her creation work that she's done for some of my models. And then, so I upload the model, so I'm, I, I'm a user of Capazzi, and I use it, but, you know, I've got it on my, on my PC at work and on my laptop, and I just import the model, import the SBML code, and then I ran the mo uh, go to the tasks and decide that I'm going to run the model for about 48 hours so that I can perhaps fit my model to the data that I showed you of MMP upregulation. And I use deterministic uh, simulations to start with. And then you get the model output, and I was just interested in the MMP mRNA, so I'm just showing the plot of this here. And this is with IL-1 at the start. So I set my initial conditions with IL-1 um, being high and no OSM. Then I could change the, I could just go to the parameters and change it for OSM. I decided that I'd perhaps use a parameter scan so I could actually look at both together. So here I've just done a parameter scan. I've got IL-1 high at the start, with either OSM being absent or present. And then when I run the simulation, I can see at a glance that, yes, my model is fitting the data, you're getting this synergistic effect. So this is with just IL-1, the MMPs, and then with um, OSM as well, you get the synergistic effect. And you get a lot more MMP-1 than MMP-13. This is shown experimentally as well. <coughs> so then I sort of, um, I, I save the data, and then I crop, usually do, end up plotting my results in R, and again, I'm just showing this is with IO1 alone, this is with OSM, so you don't get any upregulation of MMPs, but you do get the TIMP1, and then with the two together, the synergistic effect. So the model was re reproducing the synergistic effect of IO1 and OSM, but then I wanted to know whether my model would reproduce the effect of cartilage breakdown. So as I've said, newly simplified MMPs need to be activated by, uh, by activators, proteases, one of them is called matriptases, which is the one that they um, have been using in the laboratory. <coughs> so they show how pro-MMPs can be activated by adding the triptase, so they add IL-1 and OSM, and then they add the triptase, and to start with it's mostly in its inactive form, and then there's a nice time pool showing how it becomes activated over time, and similarly for MMP3. And then they measure cartilage loss, and now this takes a lot longer, although the pro-MMPs are activated within about 24 hours, it's, it's nearly 14 days before they see significant cartridge loss, so they're starting to see it at seven days. But just to look at two columns, so this one, so this is just with IL-1 and OSM, and no matriptase added, so you just get very low amount of cartridge degradation by day 14 and really nothing by day seven. And then if they add the matriptase, then they really sort of speed it up, so you're now getting cartridge degradation at day seven and quite a lot at day 14. So again, I added that in the model, so I had I simulated without any MMP activator at the start, and you get this just very low levels of MMP, just, just due to some basal levels of MMP activator, but very little of it present. And then when you actually add the high levels of MMP activator, you then get this increase in MMP1 and MMP13, and you get start to get an increase in collagen fragments over time. So then I used the model to try and simulate interventions. And first of all, I tried inhibiting JAK1. Now this, to inhibit JAK1, I assumed that that would just stop the uh, phosphorylation of JNK. No, not JNK, sorry, STAT3. So, uh, so I just set the parameter of the STAT3. Um, I just varied that, and I, I used a parameter scan in capacity to do this. And I found that you actually had to inhibit it 100% to get any de reduction in agricultural or collagen fragments. So in fact, just all the parameters, all, all the curves are almost the same. So it seems that even if you just get a smaller level of stack phosphorylation, the, the pathway seems to be able to go on. But if you actually give it either P38 or JNK, these seem to be critical steps because by doing this, you can really reduce the amount of aggregate and collagen. And this is probably because now you're reducing the phosphorylation of CFOS and phosphorylation of C-June, and so you can't get these 81 complexes which lead to the upregulation of the matrix degrading enzymes. 
Um, now, they hadn't actually tested JNK inhibitors before, so they then went back into the lab to see if they could to test the model predictions, and that, so this is IL-1 and OSM without any inhibition, and then they added this inhibitor of JNK, and, and indeed they saw a, a big reduction in collagen fragments. So just to summarise that model, so it's quite a novel approach for osteoarthritis research. None of the people who worked with had really come in contact with modellers before. And I think it was the use of SPM and capazium which really assisted engaging the experimental scientists. And they found it useful as a tool for testing hypotheses, increasing the understanding of mechanisms and to suggest new interventions. Uh, then one of the members of the lab said, well, perhaps I, I could then extend the model to look at perhaps a, a, an ageing model of, of, of cartilage. Because this uh, person was looking at um, a mouse model of, of, of ageing. So we know that there's many factors that uh, contribute to ageing cartilage. So as well as inflammation, we've got accumulated oxidative damage, loss of protein homeostasis, dysregulation of signaling pathways, and also an increase in apoptosis, where the chondrocytes will actually die, and then they're not there to maintain the matrix. So Wang was, um, she had this aged mouse colony that she was um, studying. So these mice lived in two, two to three years. These are sort of looked after at Newcastle. She collected knee joints from mice at different ages, and then used uh, different techniques to assess OA changes with age and also used immunohistochemistry to look at various markers of cartilage degradation. So MMP13 um, is uh, one of the degrading enzymes. She looked at collagen cleavage by MMP13. LC3B, which is a marker of autophagy, and autophagy is important because that will degrade any oxidized damaged proteins in the cell. BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic protein, that's important because that will stop the chondrocytes from undergoing apoptosis, and nitrotyrosine, which is a marker of protein oxidation. So I'm just going to show you one, uh, this, this a sample of the data. So this is looking at MMP13 in the cells. So these are the chondrocytes within the cartilage. And if the, if the cells are blue, that means there's no MMP13. But as a stained brown, that means that there's MMP13. And they, as you can see, an increase of age from three months down to 30 months getting more and more brown stains. So more of the chondrocytes are expressing MMP13. And then she then quantified this by just by counting the percentage of cells which express MMP13 at the different ages. And you can see this increase with age. So this is the sort of data that I had for building my model. And just to summarize, so that was for MMP, so collagen 2 cleavage, it was similar sorts of data, and she showed that increase with age. The LC3 marker, autophagy marker, decreased with age. The anti-apoptotic marker, Increased with age, suggesting more apoptosis with age, protein oxidation increased with age, and also the out one out five, which I haven't really mentioned yet, but I'll talk about briefly, also increased with age. So that's something she went back and looked at later because of, as a result of the modeling work. So she wanted to know are these mechanisms related and which are key in driving age-related changes in cartilage? So there's quite a few challenges in, in building this model because obviously the mechanisms are here are very complex and there's lots of different pathways. The experimental data consists of percentages of cells, and obviously the stochastic effects are important. I couldn't uh, mimic that with a deterministic model, so I was using stochastic simulation and also having to simulate over much longer time scale, so now I'm simulating over 30 months rather than 30, 48 hours or 14 days in my previous model. So obviously this, the simulation is going to take a lot longer. But again, I built it up in a modular way, so I had a sort of, and I'm not going to go into any detail, it's not really time, but I had a model, a fairly simple model of autophagy, apoptosis, the NF kappa B pathway, and then there's two different TJ beta pathways. TJ beta signals through two different pathways. And notice here that one, the alpha one is a detrimental pathway, and this contributes to damage, whereas alpha five pathway, when it goes through the alpha five receptors, this, this will help to stop damage. And this is the normal signaling pathway in cartilage, but as we age, it seems that this pathway might, may start to take over. So just to show you some of the results of the stochastic simulations, so we can see that, so the lines are a bit faint, but the, so the black is just showing the, the amount of collagen. We can see that in all the simulations is decreasing with time. It's variable how much goes down by, but more or less similar, very similar in each time course. But the, out, um, the amount of MMP13, we can see this gradual increase going like this with time. But also, on top of this, we get these peaks. This is because MMP13 is upregulated by two pathways in the model. So one pathway is by nf kappa b and IL-1, and this leads to this gradual increase in time. And also through the tj beta out one signaling pathway, we get leads to these peaks. 
So I, I was able to match my data, uh, my modeling data, to the experimental data by running lots of simulations, and then at each time point I calculated the percentage of cells which actually expressed MMP13, so the percentage of simulated cells. And I was able to get quite a good match with all the different markers that one measured, so that was, that was quite encouraging. And uh, just to show you some of the different markers, so MMP13 going up, oxidative proteins, those of damaged protein in my model, that went up with age, the marker for lysosomal degradation going down with age, and the anti-apoptotic protein going down with age as well. And again, I then went on to use the model to look at different interventions, and I, as um, MMP13 was driving the cartilage degradation in this model, I, the, the parameters to really look at were what ones which led to upregulation of MMP13, so this is the parameter that led up to upregulation via the uh, N of kappa B IL1 pathway, if I set this to zero, you can see that the MMP, you don't get this increase with time, you just get these peaks over time, so it's going on and off with time, but the MMP13 can go back down in between each bout. Um, on the other hand, if I inhibit MMP13 production via TGF beta alpha 1, we don't get these peaks, but we still get this gradual increase with um, MMP13 with age. And also looked at um, trying to remove, increase the removal of ROS, and as ROS was driving the NF kappa B pathway, this helped to reduce the, the gradually increased age of MMP13. So to summarise that model, I, it did help to, it did reproduce the age-related changes in cartilage and show that the stochastic effects were, were important in this model. And together with the data, this model seems to suggest that both oxidative damage and dysregulation signaling pathways are probably important in initiating the disease. So lastly, I'll just go on to the third model if I've got time. Um, so I then went on to look at um, bone remodeling, and this was work in collaboration with Alison Gartland at Sheffield University, because at Sheffield they um, have quite a lot of expertise in, in bone with ageing, so I worked with her on this. So this is just showing that bone remodeling is, is quite complicated. Uh, so after the first year of life, about 10% of your bone is replaced each year. It's called bone remodeling. And the reason for this is because your bone is always developing very small microfractures. And so this helps, to, this is a sort of quality control mechanism to maintain your bone throughout life. And the way um, bone is remodeled is by two main classes of cells called osteoclasts, which are multinucleated cells. And these resorb old bone and then you've got osteoblasts, which uh, tend to work in groups, and they form new bone. But usually osteoclasts and osteoblasts are inactive, or they undergo apoptosis after they've been working. And so the first thing that happens is you need differentiation of these cells, and they're both differentiated from stem cells, which are found in the bone marrow, osteoclasts from hematopoietic stem cells, and osteoblasts from mesochemal stem cells. And for this differentiation process to take place requires many signaling uh, molecules. And these signaling molecules are released into the matrix in response to mechanical stimulation. And osteocytes are found, are embedded within the matrix and they are largely responsible for secreting molecules in response to mechanical stimulation. And we know that the mechanical stimulation is required for bone remodeling. This is quite some dramatic data from astronauts on the Mir space station, and where it was recorded that they lost one to two percent of their bone per month, and that compares to um, that's more than what the elderly are losing in a year. So this really shows that, um, that mechanical stimulation is required for bone remodeling, and we know it's sensed mainly by osteocytes. But as well as mechanical stimulation, we know that bone can be remodeled through the action of hormones, particularly parathyroid hormone P or PTH. So this also works by activating osteocytes, but the actions of PTH are very complex because they also they involve in many different signaling pathways. And for example, they inhibit apoptosis of osteoblasts. That means the osteoblasts are around longer and can form more new bone. And they also bind to osteoblasts, which increases the secretion of rank L. So this was then stimulate the differentiation of, of the HSCs into osteoclasts and the beta bone resorption. But we need both processes to go on, the bone resorption to remove any damaged bone and then the bone formation to replace it. Interestingly, and probably quite importantly, PTH has a Caucasian rhythm. And we know that it peaks late afternoon and early morning. 
okay, and I'll come back to that point a bit later. Um, so this is just a, a sort of overview of the model. This is not, I'm not going to go into great detail of the model, but just to show that I included the differentiation process of osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And this has been <coughs> modelled before, so there was quite a bit of literature to help me with, with building this, this part of the model. And I included some of the signaling molecules that were required for the differentiation process, for example, TGF-beta, which stimulates early differentiation of osteoblasts but then inhibits later differentiation. And osteoclasts need um, a macrophage stimulating factor for the early stages, and then they need rank L receptors, rank L to bind to the receptors for the final stage of the differentiation process. And then this osteoblasts and osteocytes secrete rank L, so I included that in the model. And then I also included how osteocytes are activated either by load or by PTH. Now normally osteocytes, um, when they're inactive, they actually secrete a molecule called pyrostum, which is encoded by the gene SOS, and this inhibits wind signaling. So in an active state, you don't have any wind signaling, but once activated, um, the, the active osteocytes don't secrete SOS, um, and then wind can be um, activated. So to model the loading and the PTH, I actually used events in capacity because I wanted it to on one and off, but that was very important that the loading was just there for temporary measure and also the PTH. So I used uh, four different events, so I, I assumed that we had two loads a, a day. So this represented really like two bouts of physical activity a day, probably one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and PTH I had a peak uh, in the late afternoon and also a peak in the early hours of the morning. And I could have used time and had timed events, but that was an event, uh, as I was wanted to, to simulate this over a hundred days, and I wasn't quite sure how to do this. With, with time, but apart from having lots and lots of events. So I actually had a uh, species at the bottom, which I just called X, which increased with time and reached uh, about 1,000 in, in 24 hours. And then I, I had different levels of this protein to represent different times of the day. So that's how I, I did the, the events for loading and PTH. And then I say, I, I built it in, let's say, very small sub-models and just showed some of the how I so we validated some of the models, so I'm just going to show you one of them. So the loading <coughs> submodel, where I had loading activating osteocytes, which activate wind signaling. And there was some data in this paper here which showed how osteocytes were activated after loading, the sort of dynamics that you get and the activation of wind. And it seemed to sort of so the loading is just going up and down again. It's difficult to see this orange. But every time it peaks, you then get a peak of wind signaling, which then leads to a peak of osteocytes going up and then it gradually comes back down again until you get the next peak, and so on. So I assumed that you needed two loads and two PTH peaks per day, and this to represent normal bone turnover mass, so we set the parameters so, so that the bone mass stayed constant over time. This is scaled, so I could have it all in one graph. I then looked at the effect of just uh, having one, just one load a day, so there's uh, less physical activity of the day, so only having it in the morning and not in the afternoon. And this led to a decline in bone mass with time. And then I, I did the other opposite thing, that I had kept the two loads per day, but only had one PTH peak per day. Because we know that the Cajun ribbon can also be disrupted with aging, so look at the effect of that, and again, you get a loss of bone mass. And if I do both together, which is probably quite typical of aging, who are older people doing less physical activity, and their Cajun cycle is not as, not as it was, then get a much greater loss in bone mass. So it was quite difficult to see what was happening to the osteoblasts and osteoclasts over the 100 days because it was going up and down all the time. So I just then did some simulations over 10 days. So then you can see that the PTH peaking and the those peaking led to this up and down of the osteoblasts and also the osteoclasts. And this is very important, that the fact that they're going up and down and it's just not a constant high level of them. <coughs> and again, I had a look at various <coughs> in interventions, but I'm only going to show you a couple today. Uh, one, I looked at was intermittent versus continuous PTH treatment because this is something that's well documented in the literature. A lot of people have been um, trying this out, particularly in, in rat models actually, where they um, either inject it, sort of like one, two or three injections a day, or they can administer it continuously for bio pump. And what they usually find is that the intermittent interventions lead to an increase in bone mass, whereas continuous PTH can lead to decline in bone mass in some studies. Though other studies did show that continuous would actually help as well. 
And so I thought I'd see what happened in, in my model. So this was just representing what the normal bone mass is. And this was the level of bone mass with, uh, with only one load and one PTH per day. And this is the model that I used. And you can see that having injections, intermittent injections, did increase bone mass. And having about two injections a day was probably the, the best scenario. So you could really get pull the bone mass back up to, to normal. And continuous was a bit complicated because it seemed that you needed an intermediate level would increase bone mass. In fact, you ended up perhaps with too much bone mass. And I probably don't think this is a very good intervention because PTH has got so many different, um, it's involved in so many different regulatory pathways that probably having it at high levels continuously is probably going to be detrimental. And if you think about it, if we've got naturally a Caucasian cycle, it seems to make sense that PTH should only be up and it should be going up and down. And so intermittent seems much more natural. Interestingly, and uh, something that was quite easy to do using Capazzi was to look at the effect of using different times for the loads. I could do that with the PTH as well. So by just changing the, the trigger on the events, I could just have a look and see what effect it would have if I had the loads at different times of day. And here I've just got, so this line just showing when the PTH, PTH peaks. And you can see that if I had just one load, but if I do it at different times of day, I can actually get various, uh, a variability in the amount of bone mass. And in fact, it seems as though having the load in the early evening seems to be about the best time to, to do it. This might be because it's probably better not to have it too close to the PTH Caden rhythm. And then once I found what was the best time for one load, which I decided would be early evening rather than late evening, because that didn't really seem to be a, the correct time to have a be doing physical activity, I then sort of, so I set one load to be here. And then I thought, what, what would be the best time to have, then have a second load? If you've got one load and one PTHP, what would be the best time for the second load? And again, you can see that it didn't really matter too much during this period here, but it certainly wasn't good, a good time to do it very close to the previous load. It certainly wasn't very good doing it close to the PTHP. And then similarly, I did it for three loads. And again, you can see that it's best to try and space things out. So that's, I thought that was quite an interesting. And although, obviously, the model is not probably realistic enough to be able to sort of to sort of say, oh yeah, we should be doing physical activity at certain times of day, but I think this really leads, should prompt further investigation into the, the timing of interventions and perhaps the timing of physical activity. And I think there's something that could be studied, and Alison and Sheldon agrees that this could probably be tested to see what effect that would have on bone mass. So then just to summarise this, so the model suggests that timing of inventions may be important, and I think this is probably mainly due to the natural Caucasian cycle of PTH and may also explain why intermittent PTH is a better therapy than continuous administration. And then just to summarise, so computer modelling now in ageing research is well established, and I think the success is due to the close collaboration with experimental scientists and the recognised need for integration, and the fact that there's so many unanswered questions in ageing research, so there's lots of questions that we can use models to help address. And also the availability of tools such as Capazzi, which helped to really in, in enable the biologists to engage in the modelling process. And I think that's been one of the most positive things over the years that I've noticed how the experimental biologists who were originally quite sceptical of modelling have really now really engaged it and really, you know, they're actually trying to help with the model building process. And they even had one student who was just doing a purely experimental, uh, experimental PhD but she wanted to do some, she saw the use of the modelling and she actually now had a chapter in her <laughs> thesis of just modelling. <laughs> so, thank you. And yes, I'd really like to thank all the people in the modelling group and you'll hear some of them speaking later today and tomorrow and the Muscleta Research Group and the members of SEMA and Shepherd and Liverpool and also the Biomodels Creators and the Capacity Team. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, well, for, for, for the continuous, uh, the way I modelled it, I sort of mimicked because they actually, they actually deliver by pump, so you're getting extra PTH continuously. So I actually increased the basal level of PTH, so it was actually continuously high. And I, it was, because I had it quite high, the, the, the peaks didn't really make any, any effect on it because I had it as high as what the peak was anyway, and it, so, so it went up quite high. And it's just like that level all the time. But I think that was probably, you know, 
not a good thing to, to, to really have, but I just wanted to model just to see what happened. Um, have you got any plans to Yeah, um, and in particular, the cartilage, uh, so the osteobritis, although I'm really focused on cartilage, we do know that the changes in bone play a role in it as well, so I'm trying to integrate the bone and the cartilage together, and also other mechanisms, if there's lots of protein homeostasis of the baby, which is something to be interested in, to try and perhaps incorporate that a bit more, but yeah, there's lots of mechanisms, and just starting to, <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's more, more that could go in. Where did you get all the parameters from for, for these models? So some of them I did manage to get from literature because they say some parts were were made because like the, the signaling pathway is quite a lot known about how quickly things get phosphorylated in the gene came. So I got those sort of from there and sort of combined them. And others <coughs> just sort of start off with the initial sort of guess and then try to fit the model to the extent the data that I got from the Master Seed Research Group and then adjusted parameters. So, so if you if you uh, if you then want to model interventions, I mean, have you checked identifiability issues in these models? I haven't done identifiability analysis. I did sensitivity analysis just to see which which parameters were really you know, were changing a lot. Particularly you know, in the bone model, I, I really was interested to see which which parameters really affected bone mass, and I did that. And that's all the ones that you'd expect to come out. All the ones like wind signaling and the differentiation process. Maybe one last question. In, in your second model with MMP13, where you saw these peaks was in, in the stochastic version of the model, yes. was that due to a bi-stability in the underlying model? So that was really just due to the stochastic nature of the fact that cartilage expresses both ALP1 and uh, composites express both ALP1 and ALP5 receptors. And when we go for ALP5, just from stochastic effects, it can occasionally go for ALP1, and that can happen at any time, although it's much more likely to happen later in life because you get more ALP1 receptors than ALP5. But you'll hear more about that tomorrow when David Hodgson's going to give a talk on the ALP1 and ALP5 story. <laughs> so I don't want to say too much today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot again. Okay.